Good morning, everyone. What a wonderful sight <coughs> to see a, a packed auditorium on this 2018 Africa Day. So on behalf of Congresswoman Harmon, our president and CEO, and the rest of the Wilson Center team, I would like to welcome all of you to the 2018 Africa Day celebration hosted in partnership with the African Ambassadors <coughs> Group. My name is Monday Muyangwa, and I am the director of the Africa program here at the Wilson Center. Um, we are truly, truly delighted to see so many people join in this celebration of this very important day for the continent. We have more than 19 ambassadors represent, African ambassadors represented here today, as well as other members of the African Diplomatic Corps, and we welcome you all. We also welcome Ambassador Stephanie Sullivan, the Senior Deputy Assistant Secretary for State in the Africa Bureau at the U.S. Department of State, as well as members of the International Diplomatic Corps, heads of Africa interested organizations, members of the Africa Programs Advisory Council, scholars and guests from the government, private sector, NGO, and NGO sectors. We also welcome Africans in the diaspora as well as Friends of Africa to this very important discussion on moving forward with the implementation of the African continental free trade area opportunities and challenges. To those of you joining us via webcast and on Twitter, we welcome you as well. If you're following the Africa program on Twitter at Africa Up Close, you can join in the discussion by tweeting with the hashtag Africa Day 2018, all one word. Our discussion today on the continental free trade area is highly timely. In March of this year, leaders of 44 African countries signed on to the Africa continental free trade area after the agreement had undergone lengthy deliberation and negotiations. According to the African Union, when implemented, the agreement will create the largest free trade area since the advent of the World Trade Organization. And when implemented, it could yield many benefits, including boosting intra-Africa trade, potentially providing jobs and protection for those trading across borders. It has taken many years of hard work for the continent to get to this agreement. And this, in and of itself, is a cause for celebration. Furthermore, the Continental Free Trade Agreement should not be seen as a standalone initiative but as a building on the regional economic cooperation and integration efforts that have been built over the years. And so we have a foundation there on which to implement this agreement. So we gather today to celebrate this important step forward for the continent. However, built into this celebration is also an understanding of that the really hard work begins now as the continent turns to implementation and that there are many questions to this end. Among them, what opportunities does the Continental Free Trade Agreement present for Africa? Will the continent's two biggest economies, Nigeria and South Africa, sign on to the agreement? And what are the implications if one or both of them do not sign? Will African countries live up to their ideals and benefits of Pan-Africanisms as expressed through the Continental Free Trade Agreement and make it a reality, or will narrow national political interests win the day? What are the challenges for realizing the trade agreement, and more importantly, how can African countries overcome those challenges? How do international partners, such as the United States, view economic engagement with the continent evolving in the advent of this historic agreement? And how can the United States best support regional economic integration in Africa as a win-win proposition and not as charity? How does Africa safeguard free trade in an era where the forces of economic nationalism seem to be growing globally? To answer these and other questions, we have an excellent panel here with us today to help us speak very directly to these uh, issues. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speakers for this morning. Our first speaker is Ambassador Arikana Cheombori Kwao, a strong representative on the continent in her capacity as Ambassador of the African Union to the United States. She will provide the opening remarks for our discussion today. 
She will be followed by remarks from our three panelists uh, this morning. Our first panelist, Dr. Donald Kabaruka, is a man who probably needs no introduction, given his toil on behalf of the continent as the African Union High Representative for Financing uh, the Union and Peace Fund. He is also the former president of the African Development Bank, and he will speak to the agreement, what it is and what it means for Africa, and highlight challenges and opportunities. He will be followed by Ambassador Stephanie Sanders Sullivan, who is the Acting Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Bureau of African Affairs at the US Department of State. I recently had the pleasure of working with her in Nigeria on a major meeting on peace and security in Africa. And I was truly impressed by her commitment to strengthening US-Africa relations. And we thank her for making the time to join us for this important day for the continent. She has been asked to outline current US-Africa economic engagement as well as opportunities for expanding current efforts and for engaging with a continental free trade agreement. Our third panelist this morning will be Ambassador Kefala Yansani, the Ambassador of Guinea to the United States, who will share his perspective on the agreement and ways forward. We have asked each of our three speakers to speak for no more than eight minutes in offering their initial remarks. And once all three have spoken, we will then have a moderated discussion with you, the audience. And following that, we will hear from Ambassador Etundi Asomba, the Ambassador of Cameroon to the United States and co-chair of the African Ambassadors Group, who will provide the closing remarks for this event. So with that, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Chombori Kwa to offer welcome remarks. Ambassador. Good morning, Your Excellencies. It's just wonderful to see all of you here. I kind of get a feeling that we are having another AAG meeting. So thank you all for coming. <coughs> Ambassador Sullivan, uh, Dr. Kabiruka, my sister, Dr. Monde, thank you all for, put, for coming and for putting together such an amazing event. 1885, let me take you back. When the colonial masters got together, and decided to chop up our Africa into pieces, pieces that led to the current uh, African countries that we know today, economies that clearly cannot survive on their own. It was all by design to make sure the Africans were a defeated and dominated continent. Fast forward, 1963, our Pan-African leaders got together realizing that the situation that existed in Africa was unsustainable. That for Africa to take its rightful place on the world stage, the children of Africa must come together and speak with one voice. So at that formative meeting uh, in uh, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, Kwame Nkrumah proclaimed that you are not African because you are born in Africa, but rather, you are African because Africa is born in you. At that formative meeting, the heads of states committed to coming together and paving the way forward for a united One Africa. That institution, which was initially named OAU, Organization of African Unity, was renamed AU in 2002. Our leaders meet twice a year to discuss issues pivotal to the continent. One then begs to ask the question, why is it that 54 years later, after our leaders recognize the need for us to come together and speak with one voice as one African continent, it all lies back in the seed that was sown in 1884 during the Berlin Conference. However, I can stand here today and say, because of the activities that are going on on the continent, recently the signing of the CFTA, the discussions to do with this uh, single African air transport market, the African passport, if our leaders were to be here today, I know they will be looking at the continent with a great big smile on their faces. Because finally, we, the children of Africa, the 55 African leaders, the 1.27 billion people are now getting it. 
and realizing that our strength is in our unity. And which is why that which has been dividing us over the years must be destroyed. And that the boundaries that are not ours must be destroyed. That Africa must speak with one voice, one heart, one mind. And that is why we are here today, to talk about a pivotal decision that was made by the children of Africa in recognizing that our Africa is being left behind. The mother of all continents, the origin of humanity as we know it, everybody on earth is an African. When you look at the original continent, Pangaea, when all the continents were together, tectonic shifts, the rest of the continents moved away. Look at the continent that has never moved, Africa. And it is not by surprise that everything and anything the world needs is in Africa. So I welcome all of you to come back to Africa as we engage in this very important discussion on the children of Africa coming together and in this particular issue, the African Continental Free Trade Area. Thank you. I don't even know what to say. What a fantastic start. Thank you so much for kicking us off with such a powerful um, speech and setting the context of where the continent has come from and clearly illuminating the way to where the continent wants to go, its aspirations for itself, and I dare say for the rest of the world as well. Dr. Kabiruka, it's over to you now. Thank you. Uh, good morning. It's a tough fact to come after Ambassador, <laughs> but I'll try. It's a pleasure to be here. I think this is the second time I've been here, mm -hmm. uh, and I feel at home always. Thank you. So thank you, Wilson Center. Thank you, Ambassador, friends, for being here this morning, and uh, for the subject you have selected. So I've been given an order to speak for eight minutes, and I respect that. So after eight minutes, just call me to order. <laughs> Second, what I've done, I've circulated my statement, so I'll not be reading it. It is available either in hard copy or on the website for you to consult later. <laughs> so this morning, I want to accomplish a few things in the eight minutes. Number one, I want to briefly explain what the CFTA is. And second, what the CFTA is not. And thirdly, why now and why it is not a problem for every African country to sign the CFTA? I'll be explaining that all the concerns which any country would be legitimately having are actually addressed in the CFTA. Then I'll explain what is it that we need to do to make sure this agenda is complete. Because a free trade agreement does not necessarily lead to free trade on its own there are some complementary measures which are needed. And finally, I will put it in context, because the trade is a means to economic development, and I will be explaining why. And I will be doing so through uh, an assisted uh, yes. uh, video. Yes, I think you don't have it. If you can help me. You can no, no, just at the back. Let me see. Video? Oh, dear. Oh, dear. No, no, at the back. Okay, you you'll help me. You want to start with the video or the no, no, the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint. Okay. okay. Next, next one. Can I do it on my own? Yeah, you can do it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, let me. No, it isn't working for me. It's not. Let me try for you. Okay, so what I'm going to start to do today, no, 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 it's not this one, then before that. Okay. I'm going to try to go uh, to the point which Ambassador made. So what does it mean to be an African? Because often you are told we are Tanzanians, we are Ivorians, 
we are Rwandans, we are South Africans. And I want to let you see what the former president of Tanzania, Malimi Julius Nyerere, said in the South African parliament in front of President Mandela. And the reason I'm showing you this is to emphasize that point. As you know, that was a time when in my country, Rwanda, uh, tragic events were going on. And uh, President Nyerere was very much involved in this, uh, trying to ensure that uh, uh, my country uh, get its rights and its people. And he was explaining why it is important for him, even though he was not a Rwandan, he was not a Burundian, he was not a Congolese, but why the problems of Africa are important for him. And I want you to please bear with me. It's a three-minute video. Listen to that statement from President Julius Nyerere. <coughs> if technology allows us. It's the next one, please. It's the next one. It's the next one. <laughs> it's the next one. No, it seems to have disappeared. No, it's just in there somewhere. Ah, here it is. Okay, go ahead. Can we, are we able to dim the lights? No? Is it working? Get annoyed. Oh but sometimes I don't get annoyed. It's a shame. Here I am, president of, former president of my country. No, no, no if you give the voice. In Tanzania. We've never had these problems that they have. They can't hear it. I'm an African, and they see me. Uh, they ask me the problem no, no. of Rwanda. It's not working. Uh, I said, but I don't come from Rwanda. But you come from Africa. <laughs> 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 okay. But okay, I but then I want to go to the beginning. I don't meet please. an Englishman go the somewhere. Beginning. Go to the beginning, please. If, if, uh, if Blair was to come to Dar es Salaam, can somebody go to the beginning of this what video? What is happening in, uh, in uh, Bosnia? <laughs> it, it never occurs to me. And I should right. ask Blair, what is happening to you Europeans because of what is happening in uh, if, if President Cole was to come somewhere, you know, I don't ask him what is Can happening you go to in beginning of this video? Well, Cole, Cole could say what? I'll be given injury time for that. Yes. <laughs> it's always good to see Mwali <coughs> I'm sorry about that, but... But I go out, and sometimes, sometimes I get annoyed, but sometimes I don't. But I go out. Anyway, let's do this. As sometimes, sometimes I get annoyed. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. Go ahead. Sometimes, but I go out. And sometimes, sometimes I get annoyed, but sometimes I don't get annoyed. Here I am, it's good in the last of former president of my country. No problem in Tanzania. We've never had these problems that they have. But I'm an African, and they see me. And they ask me the problems of Rwanda. I said, but I don't come from Rwanda. But you come from Africa. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't meet everybody. I don't meet an Englishman somewhere. Eh? If, if, if Blair was to come to Dar es Salaam, I don't ask him what is happening in, uh, in uh, Bosnia. <laughs> it, it never occurs to me. I should ask Blair, what is happening to you Europeans because of what is happening in uh, <laughs> if, if President Cole was to come somewhere, you know, I don't ask him what is happening in Chechnya. Well, Cole, Cole could say, what, why are you asking me anything about Chechnya? I don't know what is happening in Chechnya. But this is not true about Africa. About Africa, Mr. President, you go, here you are, trying to build something which is a tremendous... Uh, tremendous uh, experience. But perhaps you are different, because sometimes they think South Africa is, is different. So perhaps they would say, ah, oh, but this is President Mandela, this is different, you know, it's not... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but for the likes of me, no, I'm an African. <laughs> I 
say, sometimes I, I get irritated. But then I say, why? Why do I get irritated? Because, of course I'm a Tanzanian, but what did this Tanzania? What did this Tanzania? Why is it, see, is, should this European see me as a Tanzanian? What is this Tanzania? This is something we tried to create in my lifetime. I, 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 I built Tanzania. So what is this Tanzania? The Europeans are right. The North Americans are right to look at me as an African. But I go out, and sometimes, sometimes I get annoyed, but sometimes I don't get annoyed. Here I am, president of, former president of my country, no problem in Tanzania, we've never had these problems that they have. But I'm an African, and they see me, and they ask me the problems of Rwanda. I said, but I don't come from Rwanda. But you come from Africa. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you. Thank you. I think there's a technical problem. It's, okay. it's fine. It's fine. I don't meet an it's Englishman fine. somewhere. I think Malim has made his point. <laughs> if, if, if Blair was to come. Now, why am I sharing this, uh, if you can put on lights? As we stand the content of free trade era, we come to it as sovereign countries. Or my country cannot sign because of this or that problem. All right? Well, but I'm a big country. Or I'm too small a country. But Malima has just told you, some of these countries were created in his lifetime. But at, independ <coughs> at independence, it was agreed that we're going to accept these borders left by the colonial powers. We knew that these borders were unfair. They were like what historians call scars of history. So accept them. Because if you open them, how many will you open up? Of course, there has since been an initial in South Sudan, Eritrea, and a few others. But largely, the colonial boundaries we inherited are still there, intact. We don't like them, but they are there. However, leaders also agreed. Let us respect these scars of history, these borders, but let us agree to unite economically. That was the other decision. This is why I say in my view that this is perhaps the most important decision we have taken since independence. So, but I want to take you back. I'm afraid this thing is not working for me, Monday, to the next slide, the second one. Uh, you want me to go back? No, no, the second one. Maybe I should have to read myself. If, but you seem to be more expert than I. <coughs> no, we'll, we'll get there. Because you, you have spoiled my story. Now, I have the way I wanted to explain this is to show you that some of people who always lecture to us Africans, you should do this, you should do the other, should read history. And I was intending to ask you, this is a book, that is the author, and I was going to ask you, what continent is this? The other day when I was giving a statement and I asked people in the audience, what is this continent, the savage continent? Of course, the hands went up to say the answer is, until I showed them the next slide. This is Europe after World War II. And the book of the Savage Continent is describing Europe after World War II. Next slide. These people talk about refugees and migrants nowadays as if the whole of Africa is emptying going to Europe. There have been some controversy about this particular picture, uh, but I've been told, I'm not sure, the Zua refugees leaving the European continent. All right? This is what he said. I've heard some other stories, but as the Ghanaian president was saying, if you go back in history, millions of people left the European continent, left Italy, left Ireland, to come to this continent, to go to Africa, to go to Australasia, and elsewhere. And so, when you talk about the problems of Africa, please step back into history and ask yourselves, what is so specific about our problems? But I want to show you, by the next uh, slide, what the Europeans did about it. Since uh, the, Vienna, uh, the Conference of Vienna uh, the, in 1800-something, uh, after the Europeans had gone through the Napoleonic Wars and blood, uh, they said, well, now I've found a solution. As it happened, they fought two other bloody wars among themselves. The Europeans were killing each other like there was no yesterday, until 1945. So thereafter, what did they do? They sat back, some of the leaders, and figured out 
how can we stop bloodshed on the European continent? And this is how they started in 1951. The European Steel and Coal Community, they go together and figure out that coal and steel might be something which brings us together. That's some other historical interpretation, but I'm giving it the one I know best. So they formed this uh, institution, which today is the famous European Union. Along the way, that was a long journey. European Steel Community, European Economic Community, that was Maastricht, that was Schengen, that was the Euro, now there was this powerful European Union. And the Europeans have been at peace since then. And even the recent turbulences, uh, Europeans are still together. There's been one divorce, but, oh, it is on the way, I don't know. <laughs> but they have been together, uh, at least, and they have not been fighting. It, when they want to fight, they fight elsewhere. It's like the Americans and the Russians. <laughs> they didn't fight, but when they chose to fight, they fight in someone else's territory. Uh, it was mainly in Africa, Asia, and sometimes in, in Central America. But it's important to, to say this to you, that coming together is not simply an economic uh, objective. It has huge implications for security, for safety, and for prosperity. I'll be concluding this letter by showing you that the aim of the CFTA is not simply to increase trade. It increases more than trade. It might be a having of greater security. Uh, on, the <coughs> on the continent. Next one. So, for those who speak French, the European Steel Community, which became the European Union, has been a gauge for peace, as you can see that. Go on. Go on. But uh, let's look at these numbers uh, briefly. Each time you have a speech about African trade, people say, well, it is less than 12%. But take a close look at these numbers. You'll find that in the EU it is true, 23% among themselves, these Europeans. In the ASEAN region, 24%. In the SADC, close 21%. In the South African community, 21%. South America, the Mercosur, ECOWAS, COMESA, AMU, that is North Africa, CEMAC, Central Africa, ECA, Central Africa. Truth be told, if you actually excluded the numbers for North Africa and for Central Africa, actually trade within Africa is much bigger than is often reported. As you can see, in the South African community and the SADC, we're not far from Asia. But the average you often hear is because there is very little trade in the Central African region and the North African region. But we have made a lot of progress in the regional groupings in terms of expanding trade. So each time you hear the famous figure 12%, Stay back and say to yourself, in fact, in some regions, we're doing quite okay. We can do even better. These uh, numbers are from uh, Brookings, I think, or CGD. Mm -hmm. I'll check the source. Go on. Now, so, but as we trade, what do we trade? This is what we trade. Commodities, whether they're soft commodities or hard commodities. But the CFTA, the aim, is the next one. We want to go from here to there, to industrialization and development of human capital, to go from exporting oil, exporting tea and coffee, to developing human capital and uh, industrialization. So what is the misunderstanding then about the CFTA? Why are some countries hesitating? They're hesitating because they think it means total liberalization. In fact, the CFTA does not totally liberalize. It only liberalizes 90%. The 10% is still open for countries, next one, for countries to give either a positive list or a negative list, as the case may be, I'll explain. But mainly this has been the worries of the countries not signing. That'd be dumping, loss of jobs, rules of origin won't be uh, respected, revenue loss, infant industries, and all that. And what I'm suggesting is that, in fact, all these things are addressed in the CFTA. So uh, every country can provide a list of goods they consider to be sensitive. 
So if you feel, for example, your textile industry is sensitive, you opt out of the CFT in that side. If you think, for example, maybe you are in the pharmaceutical industry, you can say this is protected for some time. So for those countries thinking that everything is open, and the infant industry, sometimes these infants are over 20 years, but still, if you want to protect them for some time, it is allowed for in the CFT. If you think some particular area are sensitive, you can keep them out <laughs> for some time. So there's no reason for any country to fear that somehow the industries will be destroyed. There's no reason for a country to fear revenue loss from customs. I can tell you from the experience of my own country, when, we, when this government came to power, the tariffs were very, very high, sometimes up to 100%. And the government reduced the tariffs. There was a fear that there would be revenue losses, job losses. In fact, in fact, quite the contrary. Jobs have expanded, new factories have been coming, and revenues have actually increased. And not surprising, because of increased domestic activity. And I believe for CFTA is the same. Now, one more thing which people need to understand. The CFTA is not simply about goods. It's also about services. So even if you're a country, you don't have a lot of manufacturers, just think when you bring a container from Dubai to your country, so there's a car inside, but there's also trade finance, insurance, logistics, data, a lot of services associated with that one product. In fact, we estimate that half of the benefits come from CFTA will not be about physical goods. It is about services. And I believe that large countries like Nigeria, South Africa, and others who have large service sectors, like financial services, will be major beneficiaries. So whether you are a big country, small country, you don't manufacture a lot, you could actually benefit from the services. And we think services will actually give about 50% of all the benefits. Let me show you, I love this picture. I really do. And the cutters of the BBC. And so I'm going to ask you now, since my first video didn't work, what is this? Who is courageous to answer me? Who, what is this? OK. Thank you. Now, the little empty place you see in between is actually a border. <laughs> And so the guys selling tomatoes and onions are in one country. <laughs> and the poor ladies trying to make a living are in another country. So these are our famous borders, which we must respect, <laughs> for which we need passports, for which we need visas. It is, it is a very, very serious matter. Now, I will not complicate the ambassador's work by mentioning the countries. <laughs> but all I can tell you, these are countries not far from my country. They are in the region. And for me, it shows the horizon about the CFT. If these poor ladies who are making a living were allowed to just ignore that little street in between, <laughs> perhaps the prices might go up. But just look at the absurdity of this. And this is true for almost every part of Africa. There are formal borders mm -hmm. where trucks have to go through. And then you have got this reality of every day. Now, so why we need to go quickly? This reason. Right now, we have got these economic communities. Some people call it a spaghetti ball. So like a country belonging to several communities, it's highly complicated. Yes, we made progress in trade, but this way of approaching trading was OK at the beginning. But now we move to a place where we need to get all these spaghetti out into one uh, market. And infrastructure okay, is lacking, but it has been improving. And as was agreed in the Abuja Treaty, the idea was to get from the spaghetti ball into one uh, African market. But let me show you another picture, which I love. This is a picture when I was the president of the African Development Bank. Uh, I visited these two borders. 
But this time, I'm going to mention the names and the ambassador of the AU will protect me. <laughs> it is often said that we don't have enough infrastructure. That is true. On the left, this is the Kazungula Bridge. Kazungula Bridge is a place where four countries meet, Botswana, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and, uh, and Namibia, in, near the Capri Strip. We were trying to help these countries to do a, a bridge. There are some issues, I don't want to go into them, which delayed the project. Uh, but now it is, it is moving, where four countries meet. So I visited this place. So I, we had to go with my staff through this very old rickety boat. And those trucks you see up there, that's on the Zambian border, drivers told me they could wait up to a week to cross this place. So that indeed was a physical problem. But then I visited another border, that one, where we had actually done a highway and a single border post. But I found that trucks, as you can see on this left side, were also waiting for a week. <laughs> so on one side, Trucks are waiting because there is no physical infrastructure. On another place, there is physical infrastructure, but trucks are still waiting. Why? Excessive documentation, security checks, uh, a lot of uh, disconnect between different departments, those who do health and regulation, visas, and all this. What are known in the language is non-tariff restrictions. And so, what would be extremely important after signing the CFTA is to address these non-tariff restrictions. In fact, we do think that if you address the non-tariff restrictions, you could almost double the level of trade, not simply increases by 52%. So African leaders, African business people have a lot of work to do. I'm being wondered that I'm done, mm -hmm. that, that I have two minutes. But I want to emphasize this, because uh, we can sign this CFTA and then when we go back to our countries, then under pressure from business people, <coughs> under pressure from other groups, governments go back to this kind of restrictions. Again, I'll not mention the other place because of diplomatic reasons, <laughs> but uh, if you allow me, I can tell you. Please do. That is on the border between Kenya and Tanzania, a place called Namanga, which I know very well because we help the two governments do that highway. And of course, we took up the matter with the two governments. And uh, they have since made a lot of progress. But it's the same for many other borders. So the non-tariff restrictions are as important, even more important, as tariff restrictions. So let me now conclude, since uh, I've been called to order. Why is this thing important? It is not important simply to remove tariffs and non-tariff restrictions. Our population will be exploding. There is something called the demographic dividend. A number of older people are fewer, younger people are fewer, so we've got a large workforce. But this large workforce, we need a larger economic space. And the only way to benefit from the demographic dividend is to ensure that we have this CFTA and non-tariff restrictions out of the way. Last one. Second reason, look at this factory closely. In this factory, there are very few human beings. Those are robots making cars. Now, robots are harvesting maize. Robots are harvesting vegetables. Robots, by the way, are doing something else. Just look next door. Next. This patient is being looked after by a robot. So I'm saying this because I've heard that people say we'll have a large working force. But in the next 30 years, we'll be faced with this. And the only way to overcome this problem is to bring our market together, and of course, with training. So there is demographic shifts. There is uh, this uh, problem they call the fourth industrial revolution, which will mean that we we'll need to do something different from what we've done in the past to benefit from the demographic dividend. One more thing, and this is, I think, the last but one. Look at what's happening in the world. What is happening in the world is that countries are going back to nationalism. My country first. Haven't you heard that? Close to this place? My country first. You know what Australia is doing? Australia is uh, 
the Australian Navy keeps away the immigrants from, uh, from Indonesia. Uh, every country is looking after its own interests. But we cannot, as 55 countries, say, my country first. It is my country and my African neighbors together. Because we don't have this luxury. But they, I don't even think these people have the luxury. But they have taken the narrow nationalist lines to say, each one country can serve its own interest. Next one. So, this is the very last. <laughs> All this comes together in the reforms of the African Union, which is led by President Paul Kagame of Rwanda. This is basically what uh, President Kagame has pro proposed. When you look at the document, you can take a careful look. It looks at issues of focusing the union, financing the union, realigning the union, better manage the union, finance the union. Everything is there. And therefore, the CFT for me is not simply about trading. It's part of a larger uh, effort we have to make. And so I want to thank you for listening to me. I'm sorry I've exceeded by two minutes. No, no, no. By, but there, by was, more than two there was injury time. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So I, uh, I hope this is helpful. Uh, I've secreted my text, and I think this PowerPoint is also available. Yes. And I am happy to answer your questions uh, if you have some. Thank you very much and fair patience. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaberuka. Um, we will share your presentation, but only after the event. I think the easiest way for people not to come to an event is to give them the material before time. So we will put it up there later on. Ambassador Sullivan. Dr. Muyagwa, Ambassador Chambori, Dr. Kabaruka. Ambassador Yasani, Ambassador Isomba, ambassadors and representatives from the African Diplomatic Corps, colleagues and friends, all protocols observed. It's an honor to be here with you this morning to celebrate Africa Day 2018. I would especially like to thank and recognize Dr. Monde, the director of the Africa program here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. As the first African woman to be director she is a trailblazer who brings a wealth of experience to this institution, and it's a pleasure to be together again. I'm delighted to see her in this capacity. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. OK, it's really great to be with you here today to discuss this uh, important topic of regional integration and the Regional Integration Agreement for Africa. And it's very fitting to hold this event on this topic in the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center. As you probably know, this region is important to me. I've had many wonderful experiences living and working in Africa and getting to know inspiring Africans, including recently as the United States Ambassador to the Republic of Congo. As desk officer for Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso in the early 90s, my area for improvement in our um, State Department evaluations, we always have an area for improvement. My area for improvement was to focus more on regional economic integration. Uh, and I share this with you, uh, not just to expose my flaws, uh, but to show you that the United States has been interested in supporting regional economic integration for a very long time, um, as well as to show that I think my being here today helps me overcome this area for improvement. The Woodrow Wilson Center is an important institution in forming our foreign policy landscape. It brings together some of our most talented intellectuals to discuss and guide American foreign policy. I was asked to address why the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement matters, how the United States is engaging economically with Africa, and to address opportunities for closer engagement. First, let me say up front, the United States is a fan. We support regional integration initiatives in Africa including the AU-led negotiations leading to the signature of the Africa CFTA agreement in March in Kigali. We see these initiatives as complementary to our own efforts to develop deeper trade and investment relations with Africa. Regional integration matters. We see that Africa continues to lag behind other regions in developing regional trade, 
And um, Dr. Kabaruka's presentation notwithstanding, uh, and the exceptions in SADC and the EAC, according to the World Economic Forum, roughly 12% of total African exports are to regional neighbors, compared to, say, 25% in ASEAN and over 60% in the European Union. By opening African markets to regional trade and lowering barriers to trade and investment that were so uh, appropriately illustrated by the slideshow of my um, previous speaker here, the African CFTA lays the groundwork for greater competitiveness, trade diversification, and economic growth. It is good for African countries, and it is also good for the United States. I want to emphasize that we share many of the Africa CFTA's objectives, including lowering barriers to trade and investment, boosting competitiveness, attracting investment, diversifying trade, and helping countries move up the value chain. Instead of seeing all these trucks exporting raw timber, uh, it's, we really do support the value-added activities of producing and exporting um, finished furniture, for example. Removing tariffs for regional trade can increase competitiveness for African industries. To take one practical example, if investors want to bring in high-quality African cotton from one country to produce yarn and fabric in a second country, and then use this fabric to produce garments in a third country, and sell these garments on the regional market, they need all of these goods to flow freely without tariffs. If tariffs are imposed on cotton, fabric, and garments, then the final products will be very expensive and have a hard time competing with garments from Asia, for example. Integration enables African companies to develop regional value chains. If an investor wants to produce mango juice, for example, she could invest in a factory in Ghana or Senegal where mangoes are available for only a few months per year. By expanding the supply of mangoes to other countries with different growing seasons, the company may extend production through most of the year and multiply the returns on investment through most of the year uh, having that steady supply. And in a competitive international market, this can make all the difference. With a larger supply of raw materials, the investor would be better positioned to access larger markets, including the United States. And a consistent market will encourage farmers to keep producing, confident their produce will not rot instead of getting to market. We want to work with you to help traders and investors create jobs on both sides of the ocean. As the African Union and its members strive to integrate, we stand ready to assist. We want our economic engagement to grow. The United States has sought to play a positive role in achieving greater economic opportunities through our long history of trade capacity building in Africa and our almost 23-year provision of benefits under the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, also known as AGOA. Um, AGOA has worked well for all of us. Since it was enacted in 2000, non-oil exports to the United States have more than tripled from 1.3 billion in 2000 to 4.3 billion in 2017. During the same period, U.S. goods exports to Sub-Saharan Africa jumped from 5 billion in 2000 to 14.1 billion in 2017. The United States has advanced regional integration in Africa through technical assi assistance to several regional economic communities. This includes support to efforts by the East African community to reduce the time and cost of transporting goods through trade corridors in the region. USAID's three regional trade and investment hubs in Accra, Pretoria, and Nairobi are aligned with their respective regional economic communities and seek to reduce the time and cost to trade, increase intra-regional trade, and increase trade to the United States under AGOA. These trade hubs and trade programs help to improve Africa's trade competitiveness, encourage export diversification, create jobs, and ensure the benefits from growth are broad-based. We also support the implementation of the Trade Facilitation Area Agreement which is yet another important mechanism for reducing impediments to the free flow of goods across Africa. 
through the economic growth, trade, and investment pillar of our annual high-level dialogue with the African Union, we continue to explore opportunities to support regional integration and the African CFTA. The agreement of 44 African countries, excuse me, <coughs> is this working now? I'm okay. The agreement of 44 African countries signed last March to establish the African CFTA was a major milestone and represents a significant opportunity for the continent. Did I mention that we're a fan? <laughs> we see this agreement, along with continued partnerships in AGOA, as key opportunities to build stronger economies. The AU's drive to expand the CFTA to additional sectors also presents opportunities. By some estimates, the free trade agreement could boost GDP by between 1 to 6 percent and increase Africa's industrial exports by over 50 percent by the year 2022. Of course, at least 22 countries must first ratify the agreement. Moreover, countries must submit their schedules of tariff commitments and then implement these commitments. We support the AU's plans to extend negotiations into other important areas, such as competition and investment policy, intellectual property rights, and e-commerce. Future negotiations on services will also be very important, as the service sector is a key driver of economic growth in Africa. And an interesting statistic uh, that uh, that's probably half of the benefit will be in the service sector. In short, all of this will require a sustained effort to ensure that Africa will capitalize on this opportunity and the free trade agreement will live up to its potential. No doubt, many will be able to take advantage of the opportunities that arise, including from the expansion to regional energy, transportation, and ICT networks that integrated markets will require. Let me put in an infomercial for Power Africa 2.0 at this point. Uh, just to explain to those who maybe haven't caught up to date on, on the second round of a Power Africa, uh, which looks at projects that are regionally focused in addition to uh, by specific country, uh, also look to help encourage a creation of an enabling environment, and um, very importantly, to help with power transmission projects as well as power generation. In conclusion, we applaud the agreement by the African Union and its member states to establish the African continental free trade area. Africa is a region of trusted friends and partners. We want to continue together in our shared quest for peace and security, inclusive democracy and good governance, and a healthy trained workforce with economic opportunities. Thank you again, Dr. Monde, for the opportunity to be here today and for your commitment all of your commitment to advancing the longstanding ties between the United States and Africa. I look forward to the question and answer and discussion period. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Ambassador Sullivan, uh, for outlining for us both uh, the programs, policies, and the infrastructure that's being uh, implemented to better engage with Africa in the economic space and for giving us an update on where we stand with Power Africa. So thank you so much for that. Let me now turn to Ambassador Kefala Yansani, the Ambassador of Guinea to the United States. Sir, your eight minutes start now. <laughs> First of all, I would like to uh, express my appreciation for the invitation, even if it is on very short notice, because it was yesterday evening that I was told that uh, my good friend Kaburuka demanded that I be here today. <laughs> so uh, he was our, our president at the ADB, so I couldn't refuse. Uh, after his presentation, very comprehensive, and uh, also the president of uh, our friend from the U.S., I just have to uh, perhaps emphasize some of the points raised by, uh, by my colleagues. 
But first, I would like to say that uh, uh, this treaty is really the legacy of our founding fathers, Mr. Nkrumah, Mr. Sekuture, Nyerere, and so on, but also Professor Adediji mm -hmm. from uh, the ECA. I remember in the early 80s, he was fighting, he was struggling to make sure that Africa has its homegrown program. At the time when IMF and World Bank were trying to sell us programs that were designed for Latin America. Unfortunately, he couldn't succeed, but uh, now we are here and we uh, are enjoying this first step of the continental undertaking. Um, my good friend Kabruka has highlighted some uh, statistics. I would like to uh, reinforce them, uh, saying that um, the intra trade in Africa, globally speaking, is not more than 16%. 16%, because you show 20% sub regionally, but Africa as a whole is not more than 16%. And this is very low as compared to Latin America, this is 19%. Uh, Asia is more than 51%. So these are the, the bad news. The bad news also is about the fragmentation of African uh, market. This is the legacy of uh, colonial system because our economies were designed to export commodities Though all our, our infrastructures were designed in the sense that uh, they came from internal part of the country to the port to export our goods, but no intra-African linkages. And this has a result of the fragmentation of African uh, market. But the good news is that, uh, as he said, we have the demographic dividend. Today, we are more than one billion people. This is a huge market. If we had one market, this could be the size of China, of Germany, and uh, this could be some sort of life insurance for the continent. At a time when, around the world, as he said, the tendency of nationalism I may say protectionism. We know that today there are a lot of trade wars between uh, major countries, the US, China, Russia, Europe. So uh, this is um, a matter of survival for Africa. If unite, we unite, then we can be protected against this protectionism. Otherwise, we are going to disappear. Uh, that's why I, I just can't understand why there are hesitations. Uh, I, I think the big two or three or five are hesitating. We may perhaps want to address that. Uh, Nigeria, South Africa, and the other uh, part of um, Southern Africa. I, I think um, it's important that uh, we have not only free trade, but fair trade and equitable trade. This means that we shouldn't try to dominate other countries. We should be able to have solidarity among African countries. This is a key condition for the success unfolding of this uh, African free trade uh, agreement. Otherwise, um, I'm afraid we may uh, be trapped in trade war, let alone currency war, because we have a multiplicity of currencies in Africa. And uh, if we do not unite, if we don't, do not agree on the same direction, some countries may be tempted to impose uh, their will on others. So I, I do believe that um, this is the, the first condition, free trade, fair trade, but also equitable trade. Second condition, my good friend raised it. This is infrastructure. We do not have 
intra-regional infrastructure in Africa. The PIDA has been uh, around for quite some time. Now I think we have to involve the private sector in the PIDA to make sure that uh, really we could boost uh, African infrastructure. Otherwise, there is no way to have integration in the trade. At point, some point, I was invited in Arusha to attend a meeting, and uh, I spent three days between West Africa and East Africa. I had to go to Europe and then go down to, uh, to uh, Kenya and then Arusha. We cannot talk about regional integration. We cannot talk about trade integration as long as we do not have good communication system, good infrastructure. And of course, uh, we, we, we need to make sure that the private sector is aware of the role it may play. It may play the role in terms of funding, but also in terms of designing the new system. If we leave it only to civil servant, I'm afraid it may be problematic. So I think the, the private sector should be at the beginning as well as in the implementation of uh, this system. Uh, I do hope that, uh, I do hope that um, uh, in the coming weeks, private sector people could be uh, invited to join the next step of uh, this uh, uh, treaty. Capacity. Capacity is another problem. Uh, our SMEs are key for the successful unfolding of the treaty, but so far our SMEs are very weak. I heard about Agoa, but as you know, in Agoa, almost 90% of the goods are coming from oil producing countries. Our SMEs are more or less excluded from Agoa. So we need to make sure that our SMEs have the capacity to comply with the norms and standards and to be able to trade uh, with other countries, with Nigeria, with South Africa, with Kenya. I welcome the offer of uh, assisting our countries to build capacity of uh, our SMEs. I think this is, uh, this is key for, um, for Africa. Now, the next step. I heard that uh, we, we have to uh, engage in a new round of negotiation. Uh, our sister from uh, African Union is here. I think that you really should push our leaders to make it and very quickly. Otherwise, time is running out and uh, progression is, is coming. Uh, I don't think that we have the luxury to a uh, waste time in uh, you know, a discussion about uh, the, the, the merit, it's already there. We need to unite. It's a matter of survival. So I, I think uh, it's to take and to give, and uh, our countries have this life insurance at hand, and we need to uh, take advantage of it. Otherwise, I'm afraid uh, we may certainly uh, behind uh, the schedule. So um, I don't think that uh, I, I may say more than uh, what my good friend already said, but I'm very happy to be here and I will be uh, very pleased to respond to any questions, but I'm sure that um, my friend is, will be uh, able to respond to more questions than uh, I may do. Okay, yeah. Thank you all for going to Uh, thank you so much, Ambassador Yasane. And I must say, I am absolutely grateful uh, that you acknowledge the late Professor Adedeji, who for many of us really is the father of regional integration. He was a lone voice yeah. early in the 70s and 80s, calling for the right kind of in, uh, regional integration in Africa. And really his passing is a great loss for the continent. And I wish you were here uh, to see the CFTA being signed. So thank you so much uh, for giving him that acknowledgement on this special day. 
So it's now time for Q&A. And I will get directly into it. So what we're going to do is if you want to make a comment, uh, ask a question, please raise your hand. We'll take three questions at a time or three comments at a time. Each of you has under one minute to make your comment or ask your question. And I do have a red card, <laughs> which I will not hesitate to use. Uh, so please identify yourself, the organization with which you're affiliated, and the speaker to whom you are addressing uh, the question. And so with that, the floor is open. I'll start with the gentleman right up here in the middle. Uh, can we get a mic to him, please? Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Anshu. I'm a reporter with Inside U.S. Trade, and thanks to the, to the panel for being here. Um, I, I just wanted to ask, because you know, we've been talking about regional and continental integration, um, and the U.S. Trade Representative, Ambassador Lighthizer, has said that he wants to do a bilateral free trade agreement with an African country that will become a model FTA for the rest of the, the region. So I'm just curious, um, Ambassador Sullivan, or perhaps maybe other panelists, how, how does a U.S. bilateral trade agreement fit into regional and continental integration in Africa? Thanks. All right. You take another question. Uh, the gentleman right behind him. I'll, I'll move to this side next. Thank you. My name is Andrew Astuno. I'm a legal consultant with the World Bank Group. I have a very quick, brief question. I understand Nigeria, some other economies as well, have opposed this free trade agreement. Just wondering if anyone on the panel would care to briefly summarize what that position, what the reasoning would be for a country like Nigeria to not want to partake and what your response to that position would be. Thank you. Actually, if you don't mind, let me rephrase that. Um, it was not that Nigeria opposed. I think Nigeria wasn't ready to sign. So the question is, what are the issues as to why Nigeria wasn't ready to sign? So we don't know whether they'll sign or not, but I think opposition uh, is not quite what it was. Okay. All right. That's fine. Thank you. But it, it, it is a valid question, a really valid question. So there was a gentleman on this side. Or maybe there wasn't. So the gentleman right behind him. There's a gentleman in the white shirt, pink shirt. I can't quite tell. Hi. Yes. My name is... My name is Obin. Uh, I'm from Ashinaga, um, Af Ashinaga African Ashinaga African Initiative. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a student at at Montreal, Canada, Montreal, Montreal University at Computer Engineering. What I'm going to move the mic up to you. Yeah. What I'm going to ask you is like two questions. Uh uh. One, okay, one question. <laughs> Maybe choose one first. Okay. <laughs> My question is like, how can we be different? Like when you say like certificate like, agreement with those like uh, now. Uh, verification or on, on the board, how can it be different for those agreements? He said, Mr. Dr. Kaveruka, right? The agreement for the safety A, the, the free trade mm -hmm. on the board, how can we improve like those ver verification, documentation on okay. the board? Yeah. Because okay. when, I, when I'm listening those agreements, I can see how, how to be different. Okay, so three very good questions. The first one, I think, directly to you, Ambassador Sullivan, in terms of the U.S. general approach in terms of its desire to engage in bilateral agreements and how that would articulate uh, with the Continental Free Trade uh, Agreement. And I've heard other Africans talk about this. There's a sense that the United States is taking a divide-and-conquer approach, which undermines this CFTA. Is that what the United States is trying to do? And if not, how does that engage with the aspirations and the goals of the, S, uh, the CFTA? Second question, why is it uh, that uh, Nigeria did not sign when the other 44 countries signed alongside uh, South Africa? What were the core issues and how do we overcome uh, <coughs> those hesitations? Um, the third question to you, Dr. Kaberuka, really has to do with how do we overcome the list of non-tariff barriers uh, that you uh, talked about in your presentation, you know, the excessive paperwork, the security concerns, and um, all of those other issues. So I will start from Ambassador Sullivan, or do you? Sure. Okay. Is this working? Yes. 
I think somebody embellished the first question a little I bit. Did, but but I that's okay. Sure. I was ready for it. <laughs> so the answer is we don't know yet. Okay. Uh, and that's why we're going to be consulting very closely as the CFTA evolves and how uh, the implementation goes forward. Um, we have this idea that we would start with a, a, a small step um, and, and look at uh, how such an agreement might work, uh, how it would help attract more U.S. investment. Everywhere we go, we're always asked we need more U.S. investment. So this would be um, looking at a way to uh, have a very good toehold uh, that other American investors would, would look at, and then we would potentially expand, and this is why we're saying we're looking for a model. So we don't have any particular country in mind at the moment. Um, we're exploring with multiple countries who have expressed interest, um, but we're acutely aware of um, the various countries' obligations under both the regional economic communities um, as well as under the emerging CFTA. So uh, we don't know, but we are eager to find out in consultation with our uh, bilateral and African Union partners. Thank you. I appreciate that. I know I put you on the spot a little bit, but my job is to bring uh, all of those concerns and sort of put them uh, directly to you. So I really appreciate your response on that very direct question. <coughs> um, Ambassador Yasani, yeah. you want to speak to the other two questions? Yeah, I, I would like to compliment the response of our Ambassador Sullivan. I do believe that uh, this treaty could um, attract foreign investors to the continent because of scale of economy. Yes. Yesterday, I was discussing with a friend of mine at the State Department. He was saying that uh, uh, now that uh, we may have one market, then the U.S. may be interested in investing in Africa uh, and be able to uh, send goods uh, from one country to another country to put in place an uh, industrial unit and be able also to um, sell this, uh, the goods to uh, different countries. Uh, now for Nigeria, uh, I'm talking about uh, Nigeria under the control of uh, uh, His Excellency the Ambassador of Nigeria. I think it's um, more political than economic. Uh, the elections are looming uh, very soon and uh, the unions in Nigeria are very uh, uh, vibrant, very vocal. I think that Nigeria certainly is willing to join, but perhaps later after you know, this uh, round of uh, elections, because I think Buhari certainly would like to be re-elected, so uh, you don't want to uh, take any chance with uh, you know, unions at, at this point in time. Okay, thank this you. is my, 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 my reading. Do, do we have uh, the ambassador from Nigeria? Where is yeah. he? <laughs> 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 <right>. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I did want to give you an opportunity to add some, but I appreciate your response, uh, so thank you uh, uh, very much. Dr. Kaberuka, over to you on the question, particularly on the non-tariff barriers. Thank you. Uh, you know, I'm uh, like many of you, I read the Bible. <laughs> so the statement I've written, I called it, there is time for everything. That's what the Bible says. And I said that for a purpose. Uh, I believe that Nigeria will sign up. I believe that Nigeria will sign up for a simple reason. It will be a huge beneficiary. Of course. From physical goods and services. And the concerns which industry or government would have are addressed, as I mentioned here. The 11 countries who did not sign up, it's not only Nigeria, by the way, there are others, which are not simply stigmatized Nigeria. Uh, Nigerian officials were highly involved in the negotiation of the CFT up to the end. They have domestic issues to address. I'm confident they'll address them, and that before the end of the year, uh, the 11 countries would have signed up because there is no reason not to sign up. Uh, I cannot find any. Uh, if there is a little of sensitive goods they want to keep out for now, they can. If there is uh, an area, a sector they want to protect, they can under the CFTA. 
And uh, there will be major beneficiaries in terms of uh, services. Nigerian banks have been crossing the border between to other countries. Nigerian businessmen like Dangote and others. So there will be huge beneficiaries. Now, there is one technical issue I should explain here. Uh, where I think some business people, out of lack of information, often put pressure on government. This is about dumping. Dumping means another country is sending goods to a country below cost. I don't believe there's any African country which has the capability of dumping on another African country. No. It's just not possible. <laughs> it is foreign countries who have the ability to dump in Africa. <laughs> but what I would say, this has nothing to do with the CFTA. Under the WTO already now, our country should be having anti-dumping rules. Even if the CFTA was not in place, our countries should have anti-dumping regulations. So we should not confuse the CFTA and anti-dumping. I don't believe that there's a country in Africa which can dump in another African country. If you know one, let me know. So that is one thing. Number two is about movement of people. A fear that, well, if we open up, we will be flooded. Frankly, ask Rwandans who are in this room. I can see uh, the ambassador, she's here. Rwanda decided to open up. We're a small country, 12 million people. And we live on 26,000 square kilometers. Right? 26,000 square kilometers. That is 10% of the Ivory Coast. That is 10% of Gabon. But Rwanda has been a huge beneficiary of these African skills coming in. And they've been able to manage any downside of opening up. So there are fears which can only be addressed together. What are the security fears, money laundering, traffickers? There are enough competent organs to handle those issues. But I do believe that when you open up to movement of people, all of us will be huge beneficiaries. It's a matter of explaining to people how you manage the downside. Thank you so much. Let me um, turn, we have an overflow room and I just wanna make sure that they are included in the um, question and answer period and engagement with our speakers. So before I turn to the next round, we do have one question from the overflow room and I don't know if any of you are able to speak to it. And the question is, can you address the role of AFRINIC, that is Internet Numbers Registry for Africa, as a facilitator for trade? And this is from William Cunningham who is an unaffiliated member of ICANN, the Internet Comp for assisting names and numbers, for assigning names and numbers, sorry. So I, I, I don't know if any of you can uh, speak to the role of IT in general and the Internet in particular in terms of facilitating uh, the CFTA. All right. Uh, so this is obvious. Uh, the Internet is a new infrastructure. And I didn't show you uh, near the end of my statement the kind of world we are moving in. We are moving into a world of knowledge. So knowledge will be the most important product uh, for trading. So I do believe that uh, broadband, uh, access, uh, availability of uh, internet for our people is not only important for the free trade area, it's important for the new economy which we are moving into. Uh, we don't know what the future jobs will be, but I wouldn't even discuss that. And therefore, ability to access information right now is perhaps the most important commodity we need to accelerate uh, in our continent. Now, uh, for the CFTA, it's obvious. I did mention the 50% of the uh, benefits of the CFTA will be services. One of them is availability of data, simply. Can I add a Sure. <coughs> so I'd just like to add a point um, about uh, reliable, continuous access to the internet and how that helps create an enabling environment for business. And when countries shut down the internet or cut off certain um, parts of the internet, uh, investors will flee because um, countries that have done that, it's been uh, untold losses in the banking sector and other sectors that already are very dependent on the internet. Um, and so that I think that uh, through the, um, Dr. Kabaruka mentioned how this is not just um, an economic agreement, but I think from a political perspective, it can also help uh, countries that want to attract this type of investment um, and economic growth to have good policies and, and good governance, uh, particularly as it relates to the internet. 
I'll take another if quick. I may, if oh, I may, sure. <coughs> I think the serial penetration in Africa is huge. Uh, market women, not well educated, are using cell phone, uh, you know, uh, as in the US, as in Europe. So I do believe that um, uh, these new technologies are really adapted to African conditions because they could help us to leapfrog instead of going through the traditional channels of technologies. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take another quick round of questions. Okay, so I see we have eight minutes left. So here's what I'm gonna do. Um, I'll try and fit everybody in. So I'll start from this corner. If you can take about 30 seconds, so go directly to your question. And then I'll take it to the six hands that I saw and then turn it back to our panel. So, sir, right there, and then the gentleman in front of you. William Zarpin from SICE. Is there a regional subgrouping of the 11 countries that haven't signed, and specifically, what's the effect of this on trans-Saharan trade? Okay. The gentleman in front, right in front of him. My question is for Professor Kaberuka. How you uh, I'm not a professor, not yet. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> How you see the role, the challenges, and the opportunities to the African islands okay. uh, in the context of uh, uh, African CFTA? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Right there. Yeah. Sorry, I missed the gentleman over here. My apologies. My name is Jose Maciel with Fintrack. Uh, my question is uh, for uh, Dr. Kabiruka. If you could um, also would, uh, comment on any uh, specific uh, comments on new developments regarding regulatory uh, 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 developments regarding uh, NTBs in, in Africa, and specifically on the EAC uh, NTBs bill, which is actually going through the process of assent by the uh, heads of state. What are NTBs? Uh, Non-tariff barriers. Thank you. <laughs> Tony Carroll with Manchester Trade. Um, we have talked about people and goods. Uh, what has been the story on investment? Uh, I see that South Africa has become the leading investor into the rest of Africa. East Africa community has seen a robust uh, uh, growth in investments cross-border. Um, uh, does the CFTA address or try to accelerate uh, uh, cross-border investment as well? Gentleman right behind him. Thanks. My name is Reed Wan from Johns Hopkins Size. Um, with the 44 countries that have already signed, at what um, stage do we expect the 90% liberalization um, to be achieved? All right. Uh, my question is, so current African trade with outside world is very big with China and European Union and USA. Do you believe that that will stand in the way of full realization of CFTA? And if so, what measures have been put in place to address that? Was that it? All right. So a lot of questions here. I'll ask our speakers to um, choose one or two of the ones that we have been asked and just uh, spend about a minute on them and then we will bring the issue to a close. So this time around, I might start Dr. Kabiru, you're deep in thought. Thank you, thank you very much. First of all, let me say that negotiating free trade areas and get them functioning is not easy. Just look at NAFTA here in the US. Uh, they've been at it since President Clinton, between Canada, Mexico, and the U.S., but you know they have issues. And these are countries with huge capacities, uh, huge volumes of trade. So it's not easy. And I don't think it will be easy for, for us either. But what I want to emphasize here is that, I'm sorry, these things have a habit of going on the, at the wrong time. So it's not about simply removing tariffs. It's about the mindset is what it means for the future generations. I say this because someone says uh, the East African countries are negotiating how to deal with NTBs. Non-tariff restrictions come in many forms. You never know what to be the next one. And so the issue is 
to reason that you are all winners. There's no single winner calculus. And I think East African countries have been le leading the pack on this. And I do expect that it will help investment. If an investor sets up in Rwanda, he or she knows they have access to a wider market uh, across uh, the continent. It's about trade. It's about investment. It's about the benefits for future generations. In Article 21 of the CFTA, I ask you to look at it. Article 21. It addresses the issue of how does CFTA coexist with regional economic communities. And it says, if my interpretation is right, that we build on the regional economic communities. So if the level of trade in that particular community is higher than what is expected of the CFTA, the regional economic community prevails. So it is actually building on the regional communities, not undermining them. That's why it is important that our friends, whether it is Europeans or Americans, uh, don't try to pick us off one by one. And I think African countries should try to make sure that their own regional com communities first, and then the CFTA before have agreement with foreign countries. That said, we want Africa to benefit from technology, from capital flows, from the skills available worldwide, and therefore, the content of free trade there will be uh, one which uh, promotes relationships with, with foreign countries. And let me say this because I'm the U.S. sitting next to the minister here. Part of the challenge we have had on financing the African Union proposals is that some of our colleagues uh, in some parts of the world have said, well, how does this coexist with the WTO? There is a clause in WTO which is called the Most Favored Nation Clause which means you treat everyone equally, whether it is your neighbor or someone from a distant land, if you belong to WTO. That we respect as Africans. And so far, all countries, in their attempt to fund the union, have listened to that argument and are respecting that particular clause. But now that you have the CFTA, now that you have the CFTA, all right, we have every right to discriminate against non-African countries. That's what the trade era is. You have one tariff among yourselves, but you can have different tariffs against outside countries until we come to a customs union. And therefore, even on the issue of uh, how this facilitates AU reforms, it goes quite a long, long way. Now, finally, and then I'll stop there, is about the islands. I mentioned that about the services. Look at Mauritius. Mauritius is a huge beneficiary of the services sector. Whether it's Seychelles, Mauritius, Saint Tome, Cape Verde, maybe these are not major manufacturers, but they're major centers of financial services and other services. And therefore, I expect that Mauritian companies, Seychellois companies, whether it's tourism, financial services, logistics, will be benefiting from uh, this new uh, provision. So I want to end by saying that every single African country, small, big, industrialized, landlocked, is a major beneficiary of the CFTA. But we have to build on the CFTA to deal with non-tariff restrictions, single air market, movement of people, and all the time figure out how to bring investment in our countries, avoiding what I call the race to the bottom. Because at the moment, a big investor comes to country A, says to the ministers, now give me tax holidays, Give me these advantages. If not, I'm going to the country next door. With the CFTA, we'll be able to harmonize our investment regulations and don't compete by undermining our tax base, which is the case right now. There's work to, to be done on payment systems because we have different currencies, and the negotiators will be tackling that in the next uh, few days. So I want to conclude by saying there is time for everything, and the time for free trade in Africa is now. And I believe that every country will be a beneficiary. Ambassador Solomon. I think I uh, defer to Dr. Kabaruka's responses. And um, uh, just to emphasize that we're not looking to divide and conquer or undermine, uh, but we, we want to find a, a foothold that will induce more interest on the part of the American investor and deepen the trade relationships. So we will continue our consultations uh, to figure out how this can go forward in a most mutually beneficial way. Yeah, um, I would like to say that <coughs> uh, this is a win-win uh, 
uh, process. Uh, no one uh, could try to uh, take too much advantage uh, on our countries. Uh, we, I refer to Nigeria. I think Nigeria would be a great beneficiary of the system in West Africa as well as uh, elsewhere. Uh, Kabuka already uh, referred to Nigerian banks. Nigerian banks now are operating almost everywhere in, in Africa. Uh, in the long run, I think that they may, uh, we may have a division of, of labor in uh, Africa, among African countries. Some have um, a great industrial basis. Some have uh, uh, agricultural basis. Uh, I, I do believe that uh, we need to ensure that uh, this division of labor could uh, result in a win-win process among African countries. Yeah. I, I really hate to uh, bring this to a close. Unfortunately, we have run out of time, and I recognize that some of your questions were not answered, but our speakers will be here. You can engage them um, in the immediately after this, perhaps, to exchange cards and continue the discussion. Let me just say before I turn it over to the ambassador to close, uh, offer closing remarks, that I, I hear a lot of hope uh, in this room uh, today. An acknowledgement that this CFTA is a major step forward for the continent and one that must be consolidated. And as Dr. Kaberuka said, that perhaps this is the most historic decision uh, that Africa has made since independence. Yeah. And I would tend to agree uh, with that, that if Africa really gets this right and puts its energies and its forces behind it, this could really transform the continent. And from my perspective, it could be a game changer in terms of the legacy that your generation, your generation, leaves for Africa's youth. That this is absolutely critical that, uh, that, uh, that uh, Africa gets this right. The benefits are many, whether we're talking development, whether we're talking peace and security, whether we're talking about mm -hmm. elevating Africa's place in the global arena so it can sit at the table as a more equal partner at that international table. This is going to be key to playing that role. We all know the role that Africa can play, and this would really elevate Africa's ability to play that, uh, that role. But we acknowledge that there are challenges mm -hmm. and that we have to be focused on those challenges. The political will, it has come through in a number of statements here. Whether it's countries that are stepping back for a while to domesticate the issue at home, we implore those countries to keep that will, political will to get this thing through and accepted and owned by Africans so that it can actually be implemented. <coughs> because without that ownership, so I, I, I understand when a Nigeria says it wants to domesticate the issue at home. Because if there isn't that ownership of this issue, by ordinary Africans, we're not going to be able to move. So I think that's one thing. A second issue that we talked about, the infrastructure challenges that we need to address, the capacity building uh, challenges and issues that we need to address, particularly for our small and medium sizes enterprise. Private sector engagement that we need to pay more attention to. So this is not just the government trying to push this thing forward. Addressing the tariffs and the non-tariff barriers and balancing that job creation with automation. This is a key concern for the continent, that you have millions of African youth who are trying to earn a living, and that these jobs have to be created, as Dr. Kaberuke said, and that the CFTA can actually help with the job creation. But we need to make sure that we're giving careful thought to how you balance that job creation with automation. Both are necessary. But there has to be a balance that allows the continent to keep moving forward. We also heard a really powerful uh, engagement from Ambassador Sullivan on the important role that partners, international partners, can play in supporting the CFTA. All the pieces may not be in place, but I think what I heard her talk about today is that the U.S. is firmly behind the CFTA and that the programs that are previously in place for economic engagement, whether it's the regional trade hubs, that the three regional trade hubs, whether it is Power Africa, whether it is AGOA, and other such mechanisms and programs that the U.S., that those are still in place. 
and that we're actually looking at how can we do Power Africa, move it to the next uh, level, which will all facilitate that. Now, there are issues in this relationship. There's no doubt about that. But there's a lot of positive to build on, and I think Ambassador Sullivan did a really good job of laying out some of those uh, positives that she hopes to see in terms of deepening the relationship between the two. This picture, and I'm glad we ended here, <coughs> <laughs> for me is really important. What that picture tells me is that in many ways, ordinary Africans have been ahead of the political process. Yes. They have been doing this for a long time. And in many ways, politics has gotten in the way. So it's part catching up to them and facilitating what they're already <coughs> doing. I would like to see every African president have this picture with them to really understand what's going on at that local level that facilitates you know, this integration that we've been fighting for. It's happening. Facilitate it. The people are ahead of you. How do you use your political power and status to make this, to entrench it into the fabric of how Africa lives? This is what this is all about. So I thank you all for coming, but to officially close us off, let me invite uh, Ambassador of Cameroon to come and offer the closing remarks, but also to thank our wonderful, wonderful panel of speakers. So Mr. Ambassador, the floor is yours, sir. Uh, Dr. Mondi, Dr. Kaburuka, Ambassador Sullivan, and uh, Ambassador Yassan. Uh, dear colleagues, I'm standing here as uh, the co one of the co-chairs. I'm co-chairing actually with uh, my colleague of Central African Republic, uh, the uh, celebration of uh, Africa Day. I want to uh, take this opportunity, the opportunity of this morning, uh, to uh, thank the panel here uh, for the tremendous opportunity they gave us in articulating for our for a better comprehension from our part what this recent achievement so uh, expected from African countries from the founder of the African Union what they had in mind in foreseeing this CFTA, uh, CFTA which had been achieved and that we are celebrating here. I think the, uh, we heard from every one of them. I love the uh, perspective brought about by Dr. Kaberuka in terms of trying to uh, dissipate the fears, mm -hmm. fears that might come from the size of the country, of, of our respective countries, from the nature of uh, our respective economies, to tell us there is nothing to be, uh, to, to, enter, to maintain and, 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 and to entertain this, uh, this fear. We have every reason to believe that this achievement is benefit, uh, will benefit the whole continent. So I think in the, the essence of this message is a positive one. It is a positive one and as such, we are sitting here as representative of the continent. We, we will, uh, we will take this message of yours, uh, Professor Kaburuka. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Kaburuka, <laughs> to make it our late motive. Because one of the challenges facing us in our uh, uh, engagement, uh, in engaging uh, uh, those uh, uh, we want to uh, uh, convince to come to uh, uh, work with Africa. Sometimes 
they don't understand, they are, they are not uh, open-minded enough sometimes to comprehend. Uh, yeah, and I want to take, uh, to refer to the uh, one allusion you made here on the, during your uh, comments concerning the border we inherited from the, colon the colonial time. As ambassador in, in a different country, I had to confront this experience in an, in an uh, ac academia circle. Mm -hmm. Someone was trying to promote the idea that there is no such a thing in the continent to, uh, uh, from the principles of uh, uti posidetis mm -hmm. in use in, in Latin America, meaning that we don't have this kind of principle. And I, I got up to tell him, L listen, this is an academia. I didn't expect, I'm expecting what I hear here to be of the, uh, uh, the most uh, reliable sources. And I turned to, to tell the, uh, the speaker and to remind him that this principle is, <coughs> is one of the founding pillars of African Union, preserving the, the border as we got them from the colonial time. So what I'm, I'm suggesting here is that the articulation we, uh, we will be living here with uh, the way you presented this, the perspectives of the, CF, the CFTA is for us a very important uh, 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 and capital point. We will start from there and engaging our partner, United States. I'm very happy that uh, most, some of you have been able to ask Ambassador Sullivan this issue. How do the new administration intends to promoting in one hand the bilateral uh, 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 trades and coping with the reality which we are celebrating here today. So I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of all my colleagues sitting here to really welcome and uh, thank you for this strong message you have been sending here uh, this morning. It is quite reassuring to know that despite all the reservations some countries had, been, had demonstrated regarding this, uh, their uh, readiness to sign it, it is reassuring to, uh, uh, to learn that they should have, on the contrary, every reason to adhere totally to the uh, disagreement because, after all, it is Africa, which is uh, uh, emerged from it as the, uh, the uh, beneficiary. So thank you very, very much. I want also to take the opportunity to uh, express our appreciation for all those who have contributed to making this session possible. Thank you again. <coughs> And thank you so much uh, to all of you. I think one of the other messages I'm taking from this is that the CFTA is a, is a key tool in making the colonial scars melt away. And I thank our speakers. I thank all of you for your participation. And we will uh, ask you to Please join us for a mini mi mix and mingle in the hallway, but I'd like our speakers and the two ambassadors to please join us on the stage for a photo. <laughs>